Greetings to you and welcome to session 44 on the Gospel of John. I'm Pastor Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. It's a joy to be with you today as we spend this time together. Thank you for making me a part of your day. Whatever it means, however it is, if you're listening to this while you're cooking or at the gym or working out or walking the dog, however you're engaging this session, thank you for making it a part of your day. Thank you for making it a part of the work that we do together. It's a joy to be able to walk with you through the Gospel of John. This is a very powerful and enlightening book. Talks a lot about faith and journey and commitment. So thanks for being invested in it. I mean, seriously, we're, we're at session 44, which means we're almost a year into the book, but we're only doing this because we're invested in it together. If I'm just here by myself putting it out there and no one's listening, then I'm just talking to myself. So it's by your investment, your willingness to be part of this, that we are making something together. And that's a joy. And I want to thank you for that. I want to show my appreciation. Uh, I know many people talk to me about how much they enjoy the Bible study. And I'm happy for that. I really, truly am. And that's what I want. I want people to be able to grow and expand. But I also appreciate you as listeners, because it's by your listening that I'm capable and willing to do what I do. Uh, If I didn't have anybody listening, then this would just be an exercise in trying to figure out uh, the best way to spend time talking to myself. And I would be putting it out there for the internet to know. So thank you. I do appreciate you as listeners. I appreciate you as those who are walking with me. And even though we're we're not meeting face to face, even though we're not face to face in the midst of the conversation, we're still journeying together. And I so totally appreciate that. I really do appreciate you. And I appreciate your investment in the time that we do together. So thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your willingness to be part of this. Thank you for your walk through the gospel of John so far. If you're coming back, then welcome back. Thanks for uh, rejoining the conversation. If you're new to this uh, series, then I would certainly encourage you to keep moving forward. You don't have to break and and go back, but I do definitely think you should go back and listen to the previous sessions. We have been walking so far from the beginning till now, and there's so much packed into this gospel. I mean, we're in chapter 15, and we've been doing this almost a year. So that ought to tell you about the depth, not only of the gospel, but of the depth that we go in each one of these sessions. So check them out, check out the previous sessions, check out the previous things that we've talked about and, and kind of get a grasp on, on, on what we've done, how we've gotten to this point and how God kind of like walks forward to this point. So I, I would definitely encourage you to do that. Uh, as always, I encourage you to have a Bible open before you. Uh, it doesn't matter what translation or paraphrase you use. I use the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version, because it is the best, I think, for the translation and the interpretation aspect of it. It's the one that I was trained on. Now, that doesn't mean that it's the only one out there. Of course, there's many other ones. And sometimes a paraphrase or a different translation can really help us to grasp something that we're not necessarily truly seeing in one form. So I definitely recommend, and I don't care, but as long as you have a Bible open before you, this is an interactive text. I want you to have a Bible open before you. So as I'm reading along, you can see the words, you can hear the words, you can follow along. You don't have to try to figure out um, or, or put in place. You can see the words right before you. I know it's easy to miss, but we are so blessed. It's easy to take for granted that, you know, we have access to the Bible. We're free to read it, free to buy it, free to download it. Nobody's going to take our phones or burn our houses for having a copy of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, There are people around the world that don't have that luxury. So since we have that luxury, I always encourage you, read your Bible. Read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Even if it's just a little bit, even if it's a verse, read your Bible every day. Every day, open your Bible and read it. So this is a great opportunity to really dig into it and read a large portion of the Bible and get into, you know, the work that we do together. So read your Bible. Absolutely. 100%. Don't not read your Bible because reading your Bible is definitely one of the premier ways that you get to know the work that God is doing, not only in your life, but in the life of the world. So read your Bible and have your Bible open today. Don't care if it's a a digital copy or printed copy. That doesn't matter. None of that matters. It's that. That's all detail. Don't let the details get in the way of the work. You know, and oftentimes that's what we like to do that in a lot of places in life. We like to let the details get in the way of the mission. Don't let the details get in the way of the mission. Digital, printed, uh, even if it's in another language. If you can read it, have it open. And one last plug, one last piece of direction before we jump into the word. As always, you know, God has called us to use the foolishness of our proclamation. God has called us to use our words to move the kingdom forward. So since God has 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 called us to use our words to move the kingdom forward, then we need to do that. 
and this is a very easy way to do it. You have you have at your fingertips this this international worldwide connection. All you need to do is share it. So if you connected with this through the Facebook page or through the Instagram account, uh, then share it out there. Share it on your uh, your your pages. Uh, post a, post a link. Uh, tag us. Follow us so we will know where you're at. Uh, but share it out there. Get it out there. Facebook, Instagram. If you're, I mean, you're going to connect it through YouTube. So subscribe to my channel uh, so that you don't miss an episode. Absolutely. But get it out there. God has chosen us. The foolishness of our proclamation. God hasn't chosen any other medium. We've created this medium, but God chose us. So don't look at the choice and think that that God isn't paying attention. God is definitely paying attention. God wants us to do this. So you've been given the opportunity and the strength. So get it out there. Share it as best you can to whomever is going to listen. Because God looks to us, we have this capability. So let's do it. Let's share it out there. Let's let's make it right. Let's make the kingdom out there. All right. So we're in chapter 15. We are in what's called, what's known as the farewell discourse. This is the time between Jesus secluding himself with the disciples and his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. So the, the Last Supper is ended, which we saw in chapter 13 and 14. And so now we're in, in kind of this move space, this place where Jesus is teaching about who he is, about what it means to follow him. You know, the disciples thought that they were just going to sign on and, and follow this guy and he was going to take his place in Jerusalem and everybody was going to be happy and everybody was going to, and the Romans were going to run in fear blah, blah, blah. But that's not what happened here. That's actually absolutely not what happened here. So Jesus is talking about the otherworldliness of the kingdom, about God's work, not in temporal uh, space, but in eternal space. And the fact that, that you can't bring God into the world and conform God to the world. That's not how it works. Uh, Jesus has made it clear. It's made clear throughout the scriptures that the ruler of this world is the devil. And he says it you know, last chapter, you know, let us be on our way for the for the ruler of this world is at hand. It's the devil. So, so if we're living in this world and we're uh, conforming to the ways of this world, we're conforming to the ways of the devil. Now, make no mistake about it. In the scriptures, this is certainly God's world. God created it. God presides over it. This is God's gift and, and God's life. However, the world is broken and it is sinful. And that was part of what happened at the fall, is that control of this world was was taken by the devil, uh, by evil, by sin. So so Jesus says, you know, the ruler of this world and 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 that's why, look, I mean, that is why we're not living in paradise on earth. Now, it's good. It's good. There's places that are better, of course. But that is why there's still sin and jealousy and greed and hatred, because the ruler of this world is the devil. The devil is the ruler of this world. Um, The devil is the one who's always jagging at us and tempting us and threatening us and cajoling us and all those other us's out there. So to follow the life of the Savior, and that's where really where John's at now, that's where Jesus is teaching right now, and why this is not just a walk to the throne, why this is not just a walk to uh, glory in the power of the word and in the power of the world. Because the glory of this world is not the throne of God. The glory of this world is the power of the devil. And I know that that sounds, you know, kind of fatalistic or it sounds, um, you know, negative, but it's true. And once we're able to acknowledge that, once we're able to see that, then we're able to see the other areas that Jesus goes and why Jesus talks the way he does about what he talks about. So we're going to dig in here in chapter 15 uh, and see what I'm talking about here when we talk about this world and the world uh, and, and the world of God. All right. So this is chapter 15, verse 18 and following. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, servants are not greater than their masters. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they keep my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now that they, now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sinned. 
But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that was written in their law. They hated me without cause. All right, so let's jump in here a little bit. Let's get a few things uh, out on the table. The first thing um, I want to talk about, the first thing I want to raise up, and for those of you who have walked with me in other Bible studies before, is the use of the word hate. All right, so, you know, in our modern culture, uh, in our modern vernacular, when we think of the word hate, we think of um anger and destruction. We think of uh, angst and hurt. Okay. We, we think when we think hate, we think of a massive expression of, um, of energy and emotion. Um, a lot like, you know, again, I, I know we're here in Northeastern Ohio. So if you think of how, you know, Browns fans feel about Steelers fans or how um, you know Pittsburgh fans feel about Cle- feel about Cleveland fans okay there's a hatred there which I, n- I never really bought into but that's a whole nother listen to my podcast you get more about that kind of thinking and the such in there but but that's not what biblical hate is all about we don't there isn't this emotional expression or emotional component attached to it biblical hate is all about turning one's back on Okay, so when Jesus says, if you hate mother and father, if you want to be my disciples, you have to hate mother and father. That is not to say that you have to, but you have to turn your back on them. Um, You can't, you can't do both. If mother and father are telling you you got to be Jews and you want to be a Christian, you got to choose. And you can't choose mother and father. You can't choose the old ways and expect the new way to perform and move forward. So when we talk about hate, we need to be clear that that's what we're talking about when it comes from the scriptures. It's not meant to be some kind of massive emotional expression. It is meant to be far more turning the back on. So if the world hates you, if the world turns their back on you, um, and and this is true because the world, once you start proclaiming a a message that is countercultural, that is going to tear down power structures, that is going to speak to the oppressed, that is going to raise up the poor and the lowly, the world will turn its back on you because the world does not want the poor to not be poor and the impoverished to not be impoverished. Trust me, if that's what the world wanted, it would happen. There is enough. There is more than enough. You know, looking at looking at money, there's more than enough money in the hands of a few to change the lives of the whole. Okay? There's more than enough food to go around. There's more than enough houses to go around. We actually have uh, statistically, now I'm, I'm not sure if the statistic is still the same, but it was here last year or the year before. There are more empty houses in the United States than there are homeless people. So that ought to tell you something about the fact that it is not that we lack the resources it is like it is we lack the desire we as a species lack the desire to bring about um clarity and equality and justice we do it's our sin it's our brokenness um and and a lot of us are powerless to do anything about it because we don't operate in those systems of power but none of us are powerless to speak out against it so jesus is telling the disciples look the world's going to hate you because you signed on with me because you're preaching my word but be aware they're not hating you they're hating me they've hated me long before they hate you they've turned their back on me long before they turn their back on you remember this is the word of god made flesh this is the one that was present at creation this is the one that breathed the word into the people in the old testament so the people of god who have had the word for decades centuries and have ignored it and abandoned it they are the ones that jesus is talking about they are the ones that hate as jesus says look if they hate you be aware they hated me before they hated you they hate the word they hate the discipline and the authority of god again and let's not get caught up in this idea that when we talk about hate we mean this angst and this anger no 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 no. that is not it what we're talking about is turning away and when we look at where the people of israel are when we look at what happened to the people of israel really from the babylonian captivity on they've really turned away from god's commands and precepts they've turned away at this point in time as jesus is walking around you know the leaders of the temple cult they're in bed with the romans so the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, they're all, they've all turned their back on God. They've all hated the word for power and protection. That, that's what this is about. They've all hated the word for power and protection. They have turned their back on the word of God. They have turned their back on the presence of Christ, which means for the disciples, they're going to turn their back on the disciples too. 
The disciples aren't going to be any different. They've already turned their back on the word. This is just a different expression of the word. So Jesus wants it to be clear to the disciples, look, if they hate you, it's not because of you, it's because of me. If they hate you, it's not because of you, it's because of me. They've hated me longer than they've hated you. They've hated me longer than they've hated you. They've hated me for centuries. This is passed down from century to century, from turning back on authority to turning back on authority. That is the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the chief priests over a series of centuries have eroded the authority of God in the temple for their own power and their own willingness and their own desire. Look, if this wasn't true, then Jesus never would have come. I don't want to sound like I'm throwing, um, you know, the people of God under the bus because I'm, I'm really not. I'm just stating the obvious. If the people of God had adhered to God's word and really striven to follow it, then reality and, and history would have been different. But they didn't. They turned from the word. They turned from the authority of God. They turned from the work of God to go their own way. And in doing so, they hated the word. And so that's what Jesus is saying. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. You're just the next incarnation. You're just the next piece. Now you have me incarnate in word and flesh, but my word, my teaching has been hated for centuries. This is just a different way for me to try to come in and bring about clarity and light. Because prior to Jesus showing up, the word was always held in the hands of, the, the, of the, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes. So they could hate, but then they could obfuscate and keep the people ignorant and out of the word. So then Jesus goes on to say, look, they hate you because they hated me first. If you would have belonged to the world, if you wouldn't just be out fishing and doing nothing, and then and nobody would hate you. Nobody would bother you. If you, were, if you were out just doing whatever your own thing, then nobody would bother you. You know, a long time ago in, in my ministry, <clears throat> uh, I, I had a lot of resistance uh, with the people I was working with early on in my ministry. Um, it's a pretty broken system, but at, at any rate. Um, and, I, and I'd go to my, my mentor and I'd talk to my mentor about this. I mean, I just don't get why there's such resistance, why there's, you know, such negativity and, and pushback. And he said, it's because you're doing the work of God. If you weren't doing anything, nobody would care. If you were in the world, the world wouldn't care. The world would leave you alone. They'd be like, yeah, whatever. We'll ignore you. But you're doing the work of God. And because you're doing the work of God, the world, or more particularly, the devil doesn't like it. And because the devil doesn't like it, the devil is going to push back on it. That's what the devil does. So Jesus is saying, look, if you were in the world, nobody would care. Nobody would pay attention to you, but you're not in the world. You're in me. And because you're in me, people are going to hate you. People are going to turn their backs on you. The world is going to turn its back on you because the world has turned its back on me. The world has turned its back as a whole on justice and peace and negotiation and feeding the hungry and raising up the poor and dealing with the oppressed. The world hates that, so the world's not going to do it. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You have stepped out of this soup, this cesspool, Christ chose the disciples and they chose to follow Christ. So now they are outside of the world. They're not part of the world anymore. The world isn't part of them. They are against it. They are outside of it. Because they have tied on with Christ, the world doesn't like them, hates them, turns their back on them. Now, I, w- I want to raise, I want to bring this into modern context because we really, in our world today, uh, we are really, really blessed by the fact that the world. The world does take umbrage to Christians, of course. The world takes umbrage to anything that that allows it or encourages questioning authority. But we don't live in a world where, at least here in in the West, in in the United States and Western Europe, where we're threatened for our faith. We don't. I mean, if you're understanding the words that I'm speaking and you're listening to them without hiding in a a corner or hoping that someone doesn't catch your download, then then most likely you're going to be able to go to church. And when you go to church, no one's going to stop you, arrest you. Your church is going to be open to publicly broadcast. And you may even have a cross in the front of your church. And, um, and, and nobody's going to say anything. Nobody's going to say anything because, you know, the, the, world, the world may hate us. I'm using air quotes here. The world may hate us, but it doesn't hate us in a manner that is violent or aggressive. 
which is an incredible blessing. But I also think at the same time, it, it is a detriment because if the world told us we couldn't proclaim this word, you know, if we were told by the by the governing authority that we couldn't proclaim Jesus would be proclaiming Jesus. You know, it's a, you know, it, it, you walk in across a bridge and, and you're not going to jump off the bridge. But if someone tells you not to jump off the bridge, what are you going to do? You're going to consider it. Maybe you'll even do it. It depends on how you uh, how you view authority. So so Jesus is like, look, if you belong to the world, the world wouldn't care. But because you don't belong to the world, because you belong to me, because you are connected to me, the world hates you now. In a lot of ways, the world hates Christians still. The world turns its back on Christians because we do talk about um, we talk about a freedom of oppression and justice and equality. We do talk about ending racism. We do talk about dealing with and feeding the poor and clothing the naked, all the things that Jesus does. And you know what? I mean, it's really kind of countercultural. It's really kind of against what the world wants. The world really just wants to make the rich happy and shut the poor up. That's what the world wants, because the rich give money and the poor are a, are a drain. That's that's how the world functions. So when we call it out for what it is, well, the world doesn't want to hear that. It really doesn't. I mean, I'm not trying to be revolutionary here, please. There's nothing revolutionary about my words. You can go back hundreds of years and you'll find something very similar, probably far more eloquent than what I'm putting. However, what I want to say is this. Being connected to Jesus means that we are in some way going to be countercultural. And if anyone wants to connect to Jesus and follow Jesus and have everything easy and perfect and wonderful in the world, then you're not connected to Jesus. Being connected to Jesus means you're going to make the world around you unsettled. That's just how it works. That's the whole point of following the incarnate word. You're going to make the world around you unsettled. It's going to be unsettled a little bit, some way, somewhere, somehow. That's just how it works. And if you're if you're not unsettling the world by following Jesus, and you really either need to question your world or question your commitment to following Jesus. Because the world around you is going to be unsettled. It should be. Because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the words that I said to you, servants are no greater than their master. So in other words, if the master is hated for what the master is doing, then anyone who follows along a servant will also be hated because of the master. Let's, let, let, let's break down. I'll, I'll, go back to, um, I'll go back to the analogy I used earlier between the Cleveland Browns and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay, so again, and this is an analogy, you can put it anywhere, Dallas and San Francisco, Chicago and Green Bay. In, in, the, in the football world, there's all kinds of different things. But anyway, 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 anyway. So, so if you're, a, if you're a, a Cleveland Browns fan, you don't like the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so therefore, by extension, you don't like the Pittsburgh Steelers fans. Okay. And vice versa. All right. So it's not that the fans play for the team. No, but the fans support the team. And you don't like the team, so therefore you don't like the fans of the team. That's how it works. So if you're connected to the master, then where the master is is persecuted, so are the servants. You know, think Peter's denial of Christ three times. And we're going to get to that later on in this book. But why did Peter deny Christ three times? Because he was watching his master be beaten and accused, and he knew that if he acknowledged Christ as his master, he too would have been beaten and accused. And he didn't want to face it. He didn't want to go through it. So he denied Christ. He fulfilled the prophecy that Christ had laid forward because he did not want his lot to be like that of Christ, because he knew that the servant is no greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they keep my word, they will keep your words also. Again, so so whatever happens to the Christ, whatever happens to the teachers can happen to the students. And and here is and and here's the modern 21st century iteration that I think is so uh, so fascinating. You know, I speak with a lot of Christians. I speak with a lot of Christians, and the Christians I speak to most of them have no real contemplative idea of what suffering is, especially for the sake of the savior. Um, and they like it that way, and they want it that way, and they'll actually fight to keep it that way. Uh, they'll actually fight to keep it that way. I've, I've been in the presence of many Christians over the years who will fight against the persecution uh, for following the Savior by not following the Savior. But the core understanding of following Christ in the world means that persecution is going to happen. People are not going to like it. 
They're not going to like it because the Savior calls out the systems of injustice, the systems of oppression, the systems of racism, the systems that keep people in power, the systems of economic injustice and economic separation. The Savior calls those things out. That's the part about being in the Savior. That's why the Savior came into the world, to bring light and life, as we have heard earlier. So they persecute the word. They've always persecuted the word. They killed the prophets that came before Jesus, and they're ultimately going to succeed in killing him too. Um, Again, we're post-resurrection people, so we know how the story ends, even if we're not there yet. But they killed the prophets. They burned the word. They silenced those who were teaching the appropriate way. So there's nothing, there should be nothing surprising about persecution coming in the name of Christ. If Christ is persecuted for the words of the Father, then you're going to be persecuted for the words of Christ. That's what he says. If I'm persecuted, then by extension, you will be persecuted. So if you don't want to be persecuted, if you don't think that what I'm doing is worth being persecuted for, then now's the time to step off. Now's the time to take off. They will do these things to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. So, so they're going to pers- they persecute me. They're going to persecute you. They're going to persecute you in the name of Jesus. You're a Christian. They're going to persecute you. Did you know that, that, that the term Christian uh, in the early Roman world was meant to be an insult? It was meant to be an insult to be called a Christian. The early church called themselves the way. In the early part of the book of Acts, it talks about being members of the way. Remember, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So a follower of, the G- of Jesus is a follower of the way. To be a Christian was meant to be an insult. It was meant to make fun of. It wasn't meant to be uh, a, a, a support structure, a, a word of encouragement. It wasn't meant to be a, a, a moniker of joy. It was meant to be an insult. And it started out as an insult. But then it grew and it became something far different. But what Jesus is saying is here is, look, they're going to hate you because they hate me. And they hate me because they don't know the one who sent me. They don't know God. Now, remember, this is Jesus talking to and about the people who oversee the temple and oversee the temple cult. This is written about and to people who oversee the work of the temple, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests. These are the people that are supposed to know God, that are supposed to have an intimate relationship with the creator, but they don't. They don't know God. They don't have an intimate relationship with the creator because they've used their relationship with God as a weapon, as a tool to get rich, to have more. So what Jesus is saying is, look, They don't know the one who sent me. They're not connected to God. So because they're not connected to God, they're not connected to me. And because they're not connected to me, they're not going to be connected to you. Your words aren't going to matter because my words don't matter. And my words don't matter because the word of God doesn't matter. You see how the connection is? Again, and if we think about where we are in the world today, our words represent the word of the Savior. And the word of the Savior represents the word of God. So if our words are going to be accurate and faithful, we need to know the word of God. Which is why when I went back to the beginning of this to talk about read your Bible every day. Because the Bible is the only source text we have of the word of God. The Bible is our only primary text. So read your Bible every day. If you know the word of God, then you know the work of Jesus. If you know the work of Jesus, then he resides more fully inside of you. And you're able to speak more fully about him, which will cause the world to hate you more than it does right now. Welcome to it. That's what it means to be a disciple. <laughs> so that, that's how it works. All right. So if I had not come and spoke to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Okay. What Jesus is saying here is this. He's like, look, they, they sin by denying that Jesus is speaking the word of God. They sin by denying that the work that Jesus does in the name of God is actually the work of God. Remember all of the arguments. I mean, what, they tried to kill Lazarus because um, because Jesus raised him from the dead. They tried to discredit the blind man because, you know, Jesus healed him. Remember, what, what, what does the blind man say? You know, in all of history, no one has ever, um, you know, healed a man that's been born blind. I don't know if he's from the devil or not, but this is a pretty impressive thing. So Jesus is doing the work of God. 
And he's exposing that God has come into the world. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, who know very clearly and very concisely what it means to be God, what God's presence in the world means, they're denying him. They're turning their back on him. They're ignoring the work that he's doing. They're basically saying that he is from the devil. And for that, they are sinning. That is where their sin is. Okay, that is why they are sinning, as Jesus indicates, because they know that they're seeing the work of God and they're denying it. They know that they are looking at the God man, the one who's bringing the work to them. They know who this Jesus is and what this Jesus brings. And yet they still deny the power of the work. That's where their sin is. If they were never revealed to Jesus, if Jesus never revealed himself, showed these works, then there wouldn't be any sin because they wouldn't be denying the work of God in Jesus Christ. But because they're denying it, they are sinning. That is where their sin is. And that is why Jesus says that they sinned. Because they're denying the very work that Jesus is doing. They're denying the very God that Jesus is representing. Um, If I had done... If I had not done among them, all right, so wh- whoever hates me hates my father also. So, so, so because they turn their back on Jesus, again, remember, the servant's no greater than the master. So these are God people. I skipped a verse. There. These are God people. And if they turn their back on Jesus and they're turning their back on God, because Jesus is God's representative in the world. Jesus is God coming into the world. So if the people are turning their back on Jesus, they're turning their back on God. Now, again, this is really important for us. This is really, really important for us in our modern iteration of faith, in our modern expression. All too often, I find, you know, kind of the challenge of I believe in, in, in Jesus, but I don't believe in the church. I don't believe in the word. I don't read the Bible. Well, so you really don't. I mean, in in my opinion, in my humble biblical opinion, you really don't. If you're going to believe in something, then you need to commit to it. That's how it works. You follow it. You're invested in it as much as you can. I get life is busy. I get that we have busy lives and sometimes busy lives get in the way. That's different. That's different than I'm just willfully and willingly not going, not participating because, because I'm good enough. I'm good enough just like this. That is, that's not acceptable when it comes to this whole uh, turning your back on. Because that's, look, Jesus says, look, you turn your back on me, you turn your back on the one who sent me. The servant is no greater than the master. So why should Jesus, you know, why should God I- expect um, love and grace? Why should someone expect love and grace from God when they turn their back on Jesus, who's the love and grace of God in the world? That's not how it works. You don't do that. So Jesus is like, look. Whoever hates me hates my father. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not have sinned. Okay? If I wouldn't have come and I wouldn't have presented the power of God and I wouldn't have shown how God works in the world, then they wouldn't have sinned. But I did. There's no reason for them to think anything different. There's no reason for them not to believe that I am the son of God. There's no reason for them not to believe that what I'm doing is accurate or just. There's no reason for them to think otherwise. And since there is no reason for them to think otherwise, then they're held accountable for the fact that they've turned their back on Jesus, therefore turning their back on God. Had he not done it, there'd have been no sin, but he did it. And so there's where sin remains. That's why sin is present, because he did it. He did it. He showed it. He made it part of the world. And so therefore, they're held accountable. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It was to fulfill the word that was written in their law. They hated me without cause. Yeah, they turned their back on Jesus without cause. They, and, and actually, they turned their back on Jesus. Their reasoning was because they didn't want to give up control. They didn't want to give up power. They didn't want to give up their standing in the world. Jesus didn't give them a cause. He didn't give them a, uh, you know, he didn't give them an excuse. He just, they, they just chose to do it because they didn't want, they didn't want to follow the way of God in the world. They didn't want to give up their own power. They didn't give want to give up their own place. So they turned their back on Jesus. They hated him. And because they hated him, they hated the father. And this is really where in a lot of historical settings, we see the divergence happen between you know, the Christians and, and the people of God and the Jews and the Israelites. Because Jesus came to extend the mission of Israel beyond just uh, Jerusalem and, and that time period, and a lot of people denied him. They denied him and ignored him to the point of killing him. 
And we're going to get to that point a little, a little later on down the road as to how this works. But what Jesus is telling the disciples then and now is, look, if you're following me, then you're not part of the world. You're in the world, but not of the world. You're living in the world. You're traveling in the world. But the world doesn't dictate you. The world doesn't tell you what to do. The world doesn't get the last word. I do always and forever. That's what it means to follow me. And though the world is going to hate you for it, the pieces of uh, the, the, the path of paradise open to you is far more important than the world liking you. Because at the end of the day, the world will die just like you. However, if you are connected to me, your death will not lead to death. Your death will lead to redemption. That is the promise. That is what we get in Christ. That is why we allow the world to hate us. That is why we turn our back on the world. Because we want to hold on to what Christ offers. And that is eternity. So the world can't grant us that. When we die in the world, we're dead. And if we die in the world without Christ, then we're dead, dead. We're dead twice. The, the second death. Jesus tells us to be afraid of the second death. And what's the second death? The first death is the one we all go through. And that is the death of the body. That is the death of time. That is when we are laid in the ground. We all face it. The second death is when we are dead to God. When, when, when God turns uh, the divine back on us. When God sends us into the outer darkness. And we, we see that in, in, in the final judgment. That's the death that we want to avoid. That's the death we don't want to face. For anything, for that matter. Okay, just a little bit further to wrap up this chapter here. So this is verse 26 and verse 27. When the advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. All right, so Jesus goes back again and talks about this advocate. We also know him as the Holy Spirit, the living presence of God. Remember, Jesus says, if I stick around, it's not a benefit to you. But if I go away, then it is a benefit to you because another will come, one who will speak truth to you, guide you into all truth, the advocate of truth as, uh, as his name is given. So the advocate will come. And when the advocate comes, you will know all truth. And that is what we want. We want to know truth. We want truth in our very being, in our very soul. So Jesus says, when I go away, when the advocate, I go away and, and then the father will send the advocate, um, the spirit of truth who comes from the father. Again, let's be clear. Jesus came from the father. The spirit of truth comes from the father. So when the spirit of truth testifies, it's not the words of Jesus that the spirit of truth is testifying, but the words of the father. Okay. So, so we don't, we want to make sure that we're not watering down the word here. So God speaks to the son, the son speaks to the spirit, the spirit speaks to us. So that's two identities removed from our creator. No, that, that's not what we need. We don't need an advocate for our advocate. We need an advocate. We need someone who speak to God on our behalf because nothing sinful can come into the presence of God. So Christ is our human advocate. Christ is the advocate that resides in the world. He's the one that lived the life, died the death, rose from the dead, and rose into heaven. But the, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, is the, the spirit of the living God that lives among us all the time. And that spirit of the living God that lives among us all the time, that spirit living among us now, here, it's that spirit that speaks to us, that, that reveals to us the truth of Christ, the truth of God, a revelation that happens over time. You know, we don't want to think like the movie The Matrix where the Holy Spirit just like plugs into our brain and floods us with information. No, that's not how it works. The journey of faith is revealed over time, slow, methodical, expressive, so that the one who's walking the journey will not be either overwhelmed or just, you know, completely distraught and run away. That's not what the Spirit wants. So the Spirit of God in, in, in the Advocate will come to us, and when the Spirit comes to us, it will reveal to us all truth, and it will take time. It will reveal over time, expressively over time. It will not be a huge info dump, if you will, info smash into our brain, if you will. Um, it's not going to be a massive info download. Okay. Uh, so, so, but, but the, the work of the spirit, again, the work of the son is the words of the father. Jesus is very clear. I don't speak my own words, but the words of him who sent me. Okay. The father and the advocate, the one who comes after me, he will also speak the words of him who sent me. He will also speak the father. He will testify on my behalf. 
So the father speaking through the spirit will testify on the behalf of the son. So the son who will be wrongfully accused and will be executed and put to death and rise on the third day, the Holy Spirit will advocate on behalf, will testify on behalf to say, look, everything that Jesus told you is true. Everything that your master told you is true. Don't doubt it because he died on the cross. Don't doubt it. Everything he told you is true. And I come from the father. The father told him to do this. I come from the father. Everything that he told you is true. Everything that he told you is accurate and necessary. Everything that he told you is a gift. So don't turn away from it. Don't think that it is uh, not to be followed or to be ignored. Everything I've told you is the truth. So follow the truth. Okay. That's what the Holy Spirit comes to say. The Holy Spirit comes to remind us and teach us the power of all truth. That's the advocate. Um, He will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. So part of the disciples' job moving forward is going to be that of testimony. Now remember, this is pre-crucifixion and resurrection. This is pre-Easter for the disciples, but not long. This is not long before the Easter event. So Jesus is making it clear that it is not just the Holy Spirit that advocates and testifies. It is also the responsibility and the role of the believer. Again, which pushes us back to that whole servant, master, my word, your word together. This is this is meant to be a, um, a, a communal thing. This is meant to be a relational thing. It is by the 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 the, the witness of the disciples, just as much as the witness of um, the Holy Spirit that speaks to the words of God, just as much as the witness of the Son speaks to the word of God. So, so the Holy Spirit is the teacher, the guide for what needs to happen. And, and that's just how this plays out. So, so the Holy Spirit will testify on my behalf and you are to testify on my behalf. You are to testify that the words I speak are true. You are to say that the words I speak are true. This is not just what I'm saying, but this is what God has to say. And what God has to say is true. And you are to testify as well, just like I do, just like the Holy Spirit does. And just like I do. So everybody's testifying and witnessing to the word of God. Um, And the world's not going to like you. The world actually is going to hate you for it because uh, you're going to be calling the world out. You're going to be calling those systems of injustice and poverty and, and oppression out. You're going to be calling people out who are, who are acting in ways that go against the word, even if they have the name of God in them, even if they are uh, leaders or, or speakers, you're calling people out. That is what happens. That is what the people of God do. That is why the people of God are who they are, because they've been given a message and a mission, and it is their job to carry it out and speak it. All right, my friends, I'm going to leave it there for now. I'm going to stop here. As always, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you with too much. Uh, I want to keep these episodes about 45 minutes, give or take. That way, then um, you have enough to really chew into, but not too much that you're going to choke on it and then get lost. And I I don't want to turn you away any more than uh, I don't want to bore you either. So I don't want to overwhelm you and I don't want to bore you. So there we go. Try to find that happy medium. As always, my contact info is going to come up after the session. If you need to reach out to me, please feel free to do so. I'll do whatever I can to help either answer questions or what have you, but please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to work with you however possible. Thank you once again. As always, share it out there. Subscribe to my YouTube page, share it out there on your social media. God bless you, and we'll talk to you next week.